Exodus chapter 17, and we'll also be looking at Numbers chapter 20. Exodus chapter 17 and Numbers chapter 20. Exodus 17 and verse 1 says, And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of Sin after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord and pitched in Rephidim. And there was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore the people did chide with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide ye with me? Wherefore do ye tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt, to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They be almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people, and take with thee the, of the elders of Israel, and thy rod, wherewith thou smotest the river, take in thine hand, and go. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah, because of the chiding of the children of Israel, and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Numbers chapter 20. Numbers in chapter number 20 and verse 1. Then came the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, into the desert of Zin in the first month, and the people abode in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. And there was no water for the congregation, and they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And the people chode with Moses and spake, saying, Would God that we had died when our brethren died before the Lord? Why have you brought up the congregation of the Lord into this wilderness, that we and our cattle should die there? And wherefore have ye made us to come up out of Egypt to bring us into this evil place? It is no place of seed or of figs or of vines or of pomegranates, neither is there any water to drink. And Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and they fell upon their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto them. Now I'm going to stop there just for a second because that's not one of those things in the Bible that makes me think I would have liked to have seen that. To see how it looked. Moses and Aaron go to the tabernacle to seek the Lord. And the Bible says, And the glory of the Lord appeared unto them. Numbers chapter 20, verse 6. Numbers chapter 20, verse 7, The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the rod, and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes. And it shall give forth his water, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock. So thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts drink. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock. And he said unto them, Hear now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice. And the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. The Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because ye believed me not, to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. This is the water of Meribah, because the children of Israel strove with the Lord, and he was sanctified in them. The children of Israel journeyed in the promise, to the promised land. The route they traveled through was an arid and dry land. Water wasn't like on every corner like we have here literally a stream or a creek or a river everywhere you look is kind of what Oregon is, at least on this side of the mountains. It wasn't like that where they were traveling. Of course, one of the great human needs is water. Early on in their journey, God divinely provided water for them to form a rock that was smitten that we just read in Exodus chapter 17. Nearly 40 years later, the children of Israel again cried for water. And again, the need was supplied by water from the rock in Numbers chapter 20. So these two incidents are separated by almost 40 years. They are connected, if you look at Psalm chapter 78, they are connected by the Holy Spirit in Psalm 78, verses 15 and 16. Psalm 78, verse 15. He clave the rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink as out of the great depths. He brought streams also out of the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers. Pretty noteworthy event in the course of of the children of Israel's humanity and their living and their being. It was remembered, it was spoken of, it was told to generations. 
The first rock in Exodus, the second in Numbers. If you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we read, Moreover, brethren, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. So we can see, honestly, on both occasions, the rock as a type of Christ. Point number one is the great problem. We just read in Exodus chapter 17, the great problem. As we open scripture and begin to consider this initial experience of water from the rock, there are several things that set the stage for this event. There is a divine pathway. The children of Israel were brought to this place by the command of God in Exodus 17, and all the congregation of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord. They arrived at this location by divine direction. When they got there, they found and had that they had a definite problem. Again, from Exodus 17 and verse 1, and there was no water for the people to drink. I'm sure everyone has a pretty firm grasp on the human need for water. It's just not something that would be nice to have once in a while. Your body needs water to survive. You can go quite a while without eating food. You can't go that long without drinking water. The average person needs about two quarts of water per day to function. If there are upward of some one million plus people in this company, they would require approximately 500,000 gallons of water per day just to sustain life. And I'm talking about just the people, livestock, everything. Major problem, not having water to drink. In response, we hear the demanding, if you will, people. Wherefore, the people did chide with Moses, we read in verse 2, Exodus 17, and said, give us water that we may drink. People sinned in a number of ways. First, we read the people did chide with Moses. The word chide means to contend, complain, or debate, something the children of Israel were very good at. Why? Well, I'll, I'll just be, I, I won't speak for anyone else. I'll, I'll speak for myself. I don't understand why is it so easy for me to complain. That's super easy. It just comes natural. Finding the positive Giving praise, giving thanks is usually not my first response. Something goes sideways, usually the first response is to complain. Well, I knew this was going to happen. I knew it. I just, I saw it a mile off. This was going to happen. I hate to be right, but I'm right. They chided or chowed with Moses, contentious, complaining, debate. Carrying the thought of open contention even indicates a more aggressive attitude than the people had displayed before. Secondly, the Bible tells us Moses asked, wherefore do ye tempt the Lord? In verse 2, they were putting God to the test. The sin was that it was not based on faith, but it was done in unbelief. With all they had seen, they had yet doubted the Lord's presence with them. Now, I've said this many times before as, as a specific example of the parting of the Red Sea. I believe, me personally, 
that the children of Israel saw what happened. I believe, of course, they saw the Red Sea part, so they had a dry piece of land to get across. But I believe they also saw for themselves the waters come back together again on the Egyptians and destroying the army. Moses tells them, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. You see something like that? I mean, just... What was their thinking as they crossed? The water standing up like walls on both sides of them. Well, that's kind of interesting. Boy, that must be some pretty strong wind to make the water stand up like that. That's one thing to get across on dry land. To get across, to be safe... And then see the salvation of the Lord by having the water come back on the Egyptians and drown them? Oh, I guess our God is pretty serious. He does provide, take care of his people. And I've always thought, I've thought for years and years and years how, excuse me for using the word, dumb the children of Israel were. So many things that they physically saw. Now, we can all go back and count blessings in our life that had no way that should have happened except God took care of it. Everybody can point to incidents in their life. But we're talking about things that were incredibly amazing to see physically. Parting of the Red Sea. The earth opening up and swallowing Korah and his followers and closing back up on them. I mean, you, you see stuff like that with your own eyes I, I, I thought, man, I, I would be so serious about following. I would never doubt what God ever said. I would never go to Moses and complain, God isn't taking care of us. You're not leading us right. But I do. I've seen things happen in my life that, well, <laughs> that's God. I, can't, I can't, can't explain it. It doesn't figure on paper. We can't number it out and make it work, but God makes it work. He's done no less amazing things in my life that I should never doubt him. Regardless of what I may see physically, that shouldn't even matter. The fact that he saved me and has given me eternal life that is sealed by the Holy Spirit, he takes care of it. I have nothing to do with it except to believe by faith. That alone ought, ought, ought to cause me to never, Lord, if you, if you can take care of eternity, what could possibly happen down here that you can't know about or take care of? But I would still murmur, complain, always think something, another place is better, different position would be better. I find that I'm more like the children of Israel than I would care to realize. All they had seen, all they'd been through up to even up to this point, they doubted the Lord's presence. Doubting God and complaining and murmuring was so offensive that it brought before them on three future occasions in Deuteronomy chapter 6, 9, and 33, warnings that it must not be repeated. We read in chapter 17 of the book of Exodus, verse 3, the people murmured against Moses. A murmur is an obstinate grudge that stays with an individual. They carry it around. Not something they say once or complain about once and drop. It's something they complain about continually. Just keep going, carrying it around with them. State of grumbling. As a result of the strife and discord, what was Moses' response? Well, in verse 4, and Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, what shall I do unto this people? Well, what am I going to do with them? Well, they're going to kill me. They'll be almost ready to stone me. Moses did for the people what they should have done for themselves. He cried to the Lord. Well, what do you want me to do? How should I 
handle this. The no water, and probably even more so, the ensuing doubt and murmuring is the great problem. We see point number two is the given plea. The given plea from Exodus 17, verses 5 and 6. The Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people, and take with thee of the elders of Israel thy rod, wherewith thou smotest the river, take in thine hand, and go. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it. The people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. So Moses goes to the Lord in a time of need. The Lord has a plan. Those who cry out to the Lord will find he has an answer. There was to be a public display of the grace of God. God first gave to Moses an indication of the way. Go on before the people. We read in verse 5. The people had charged Moses with leading into an impossible situation. Now there would be a public vindication of his leadership. The same Moses would lead them to blessing. God also explained there must be individuals to witness what would happen and take with thee of the elders of Israel in verse 5. There would be credible witnesses to verify what was going to take place so that it might be passed down as a part of their national history. And as we read from Psalm, it was passed down. Then Moses was instructed to take with him instruments of judgment. From verse 5, And thy rod wherewith thou smotest the river, take in thine hand. Remember, the Bible doesn't say things haphazardly, by chance, just because trying to fill so many words in an essay. The Bible doesn't do that. On thy rod, wherewith thou smotest the river, take in thine hand. This rod had been used on more than one occasion, but what it was referred to in this passage is the turning of the water of the Nile into blood from Exodus chapter 7. There it was seen as a rod of judgment, bringing judgment and now as Moses walked in front of the people carrying it, many would figure that, well, that's the same one. Man, he turned the waters in Egypt to blood with that rod. It must going to be judgment again. But this time the judgment was not due Egypt, but it was due Israel. They had seen it render water undrinkable. Now, when there was no water, what was going to happen? With more than likely fear and apprehension, they watched Moses lead the way. Finally, there was instruction to follow. Moses was to proceed to the rock in Horeb. We read in Exodus 17, verse 6, the rock in Horeb. Seeming to indicate that this is a rock already known to Moses. He would remember it. He was familiar with the area because it was here he encountered the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3. The word for rock means a cliff or rocky wall, generally referring to a large rock or a boulder. It was here that Moses was to take his rod and smite the rock. The word smite means to slay, to smite fiercely, or to kill. The blow falling upon the rock was to be one of judgment, a mortal blow that would kill a man if he was hit with it. The great problem, the given plea, the gracious provision. The gracious provision. So we read in Exodus 17, there was not actually a specific count of water came from the rock. It doesn't say that. But it obviously did. Two Psalms, in Psalm chapter 78 and Psalm chapter 105, speak of this. Psalm chapter 78 and verse 19, <clears throat> Psalm chapter 78, 
in verse 19. Yea, they spake against God. They said, Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Behold, he smote the rock that the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide flesh for his people? Psalm 105, 41. Psalm 105 and verse 41. He opened the rock and the waters gushed out. They ran in the dry places like a river. I don't think we're talking about like a little trickle came out of this rock. I don't think we're just talking about oh, a little stream came down, it was real nice, soothing. You had to water a lot of people and a lot of animals. That would be the, the Bible saying the water gushed out. It was more than enough, more than sufficient. Just as Canaan would be a land of abundant provision, so the smiting of the rock turned the wilderness into a place of overflowing sufficiency. The same God who fulfilled his promise to rain down bread from heaven was also able to provide all they needed for the journey to the land of plenty. This is in keeping with the character of God. There is no restraining his goodness to his people. He delights in giving and does so generously, liberally, freely. For God so loved the world that he gave. Would that all his people recognized and were thankful for his blessings. You know how much the Bible talks about being thankful? I don't know what the number is. I don't know if you can, I'm sure it's probably listed somewhere, but it's a lot. Prayers of thanksgiving. Give thanks in all things. The great problem to give and plead, the gracious provision, the glorious picture, the final point this morning, the glorious picture. And so the water came. As I said, not in a small stream or a trickle, but in a great river that created overflowing streams. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the words of Paul to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 reveal even more. It has already been observed that the rock represents Christ, as we read earlier. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 1 says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. Now my Bible, rock is capitalized, capital R. I believe it's honestly one of the names of the Lord Jesus Christ, the rock. Notice though, right before the phrase, and that rock was Christ, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. In what way did the rock follow them? Some consider this to mean the water flowing from the rock followed them. But in Numbers chapter 20, when the people once more complain about a lack of water to drink, they do not charge the Lord with continuing this miraculous supply. They don't even mention it's no longer available. An observation that they would have made if this were the case. We've had water all this time. Why does it stop now? They don't say that. Moses, we're out of water. We need it again. Even more telling, Paul does not state the water followed them. He declared the rock followed them. The rock itself did not physically move and follow them, as some teach. The one of whom the rock is a picture followed them. Christ followed them with the purpose of supplying their need. Paul is teaching that throughout the long wilderness years, he followed them, caring for them. And despite such lavish and tender consideration, they still rebelled against him. We've noted before there were two incidents separated by nearly water from the rock, by nearly 40 years, where Israel got water from a rock. 
But the two events are connected, as we read in Psalm chapter 78. He clave the rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink as out of the great depths. He brought streams also out of the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers. The first rock is in Exodus 17, the second in Numbers chapter 20. And we see on both occasions that the rock represents Christ. There was first the smitten rock. In the scriptures, it's interesting to note the order of the typical teaching of Exodus 16 and 17. In chapter 16, Christ's incarnation is foreshadowed. And in Exodus 17, his crucifixion. Exodus 17 is supplementary to Exodus 16. Christ must descend from heaven to the earth, as the manna did, if he were to become the bread of life to his people. But he must be smitten by divine judgment if he were to be the water of life to them. The rock was smitten with the blow from the rod of judgment, not because of its own failure, but because of the sin of the people. In like manner, Christ was smitten with the blow of divine judgment at Calvary, not because of anything that he did, not because of his sin, but because of the sin of mankind. The first, uh, turn to Exodus chapter 4, back to Exodus, but Exodus chapter 4. The first biblical reference to the rod of Moses occurs in Exodus chapter 4, where Moses was talking to God and God's calling him to lead his people out of captivity and Moses is doubting the call, doubting God. Lord, I, why, why, I, I can't even talk. Why would you even think about using me? Exodus chapter 4 and verse 2 says, And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. For they will say, The Lord has not appeared unto thee. The Lord said unto him, What is it in thine hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, Cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. Reminder of the curse. The serpent appeared to Eve. It was a substitute who bore the curse on our behalf. Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. Without a doubt, it was this of which the prophet Isaiah spoke when he wrote in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 4, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did, we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. The substitute bore the curse on our behalf. Christ is also typified in the sufficient rock. Going back to Numbers in chapter 20. Remember, it's in num Numbers, people abiding in Kadesh, Miriam, the sister of Moses, and Aaron, di Aaron dies. There was no water for the congregation. They gathered themselves together against Moses, complained again. Lord tells them, okay, take the rod and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes, and I shall give forth his water, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock. The second time, water from the rock in Numbers chapter 20, there's a few things here that are different from the first time. There's a different word in Hebrew used in Numbers than there was in Exodus for rock. The rock used in Numbers refers to an elevated rock. It's important because the rock in Exodus foreshadowed Christ on the cross. The rock in Numbers chapter 20 foreshadows Christ on high. There's a different way in which the situation was to be approached. Moses was instructed to take the rod, according to verse 9 and Numbers 17.10. This wasn't Moses' rod, but it was Aaron's rod. This was the priestly rod, not the rod of judgment. 
This aspect is emphasized when we see that Moses was told to take Aaron with him. Aaron's not referred to in the first smiting of the rock. The first incident pictured the attainment of redemption through the smitten Savior. This incident in Numbers chapter 20 pictures the accomplishment of redemption. Salvation based on Christ's priestly ministry. The method which was to be used was different. Moses was told to speak to the rock and it would provide water for them. The illustration being this, the rock must not be smitten a second time. This would spoil the type of Christ. Romans chapter 6. Romans in chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 and verse 9 says, Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over, for, over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 26, For then must he often have us suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed once unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. So as we conclude this morning, we see Moses, the servant of the Lord, water from the rock in Numbers chapter 20. He tells them, take Aaron, gather the congregation together before the rock, says unto them, Here now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice. And the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. I've often wondered what was Moses supposed to say. Did God tell him something specific to say? Remember, the God tells him you need to speak to the rock. This time, you're not going to hit the rock. Speak to the rock, and the water shall come forth. What was he supposed to say? But here we read, Moses, the servant of the Lord, failed, and he does smite the rock twice. Instead of speaking to it. The water still flowed forth abundantly. It's ought to at least give us a bit of a caution. Reminding us that just because God blesses something does not guarantee the method is right. We can find comfort in seeing the graciousness of God. Despite Israel's murmuring, despite Moses' failure, water was still given to them. I've always wondered what was really... I've heard a lot of messages about water from the rock. It mainly focuses on this was ultimately, if you will, Moses' greatest failure. Moses will always be a biblical hero to me, if you could boil it down to one thing, I don't think that I at least read in Scripture of someone who had a closer relationship to God than Moses did. God even mentions 
that, yeah, I, sp I speak to people in dreams and in visions, but I talk to Moses face to face. That's pretty, pretty lofty company. But Moses is still a man. He's still a human being. And I think, Moses, you know, all God told you, all you had to do was just speak to the rock. God probably gave you the, the words to say. That's all you had to do. Why did you feel you needed to hit the rock? And twice this time, not just once. Again, I think about those things and think, man, how could you possibly have strayed from God's instruction? How something so simple. And all it does is remind me of me. All God tells us to do is believe. And we can believe and we obtain by God's grace through faith salvation. But it just seems after that we just try and take on everything else ourselves. Yeah, God's, God's got eternity. That's in his hands. Praise him for that. I could do nothing ever to obtain it or keep it. That's, that's in God's hands. Praise the Lord for that. I got everything else. Well, it's not the way it's supposed to be. Salvation by grace through faith is step one. Now, every step after that is supposed to be ordered by the Lord. Lord, how do you want me to walk? Where do you want me to go? What do you want me to say? How do you want me to respond? How do you want me to act? Just help, help, Lord, mine unbelief. Seems like my belief just, it goes in waves. I'll admit that there's times when it's very strong and you're just on top of things and just praising the Lord for all that is good in your life. And then something happens that kind of goes, well, well, wait, wait a second. Well, now what? Well, that's just great. What am I supposed to do now? Believe. The believing shouldn't stop. Believing and obtaining salvation by grace through faith is step one, and then it's the steps of belief after that. The walk of the Christian life is a walk of faith, not a walk of sight. Well, all I can see is that next step, but who knows what's going to happen after that? That's up to him. The next step is up to him. It's up to us to take that step. Like it says in the back there, I don't know if it says exactly word for word, but faith isn't seeing the whole staircase, but it's taking the next step. And I've been, like I said, this has been very intriguing to me as, you, as we look at images in the Old Testament that typify the Savior. And I believe the rock was smitten, our Lord was smitten. There's two accounts in the Bible of the children of Israel getting water from the rock for a very specific purpose. Again, just picturing like the rest of the Old Testament does, points to the Savior. Salvation only comes through the rock that was smitten.